Hey everybody, welcome to week four. Oh man, uh, what are we doing in this video? Well, um, we're gonna talk about how we can relate the stuff we did in week three to what we're covering in week four, making that transition. I'm gonna talk about some of my personal reflections for the last week, which includes forgetfulness, which is my, why I might seem like a little forgetful right now. Uh, and then we're gonna go over the muddiest points from the quick writes from the week three quick writes, which kind of covers part of week two, part of week three, which will be uh, some of the tricks of naming compounds, uh, the crystal structure is an empirical formula, and then looking at some equations and when we use which equations and constants, which could also be a bigger conversation. Uh, but let's start with how we connect what we do in week three to what we're doing in week four. So week three was really about the periodic table, right? We used quantum numbers to kind of start to understand the structure of the periodic table. And we started looking at how things in the periodic table, how we can use the periodic table to say, oh, things in this corner have smaller radii, bigger electron affinity, bigger ionization energy. Things down in this corner have a larger radii, larger or smaller ionization energy, smaller electron affinity. And we could use that to start and predict some compounds. In particular, if we had a metal If we had a metal with another metal, that would give us a metal. That, that gives us metallic bonding. That happens when we have two things with similar electronegativity, uh, that combination of ionization energy and electron affinity, and they're metals. We could also have and all of these are actually metals as well. Uh, we could also have metal with a non-metal. That's how we get ionic bonding. That uneven sharing of electrons in a compound. And these two compounds, the metallic bonding and the ionic bonding, that's what we talked about last week with the crystal structures, with the different types of bonding, uh, periodic trends kind of leading to that. Uh, the next thing we want to look at are nonmetals with nonmetals. And that's going to be covalent bonding. Covalent bonding is going to give rise to a whole lot of interesting compounds. Uh, most of the things we're going to be looking at are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen compounds eh, and hydrogen. Uh, we're going to be looking at compounds like that. That's going to be organic type compounds. We're going to look at covalent bonding more broadly than just those situations. But these things together and how the periodic trends and the locations of elements on the periodic table give rise to the different types of bonding and how we can use the information about the uh, groups and the uh, periods is going to allow us to get different information about covalent compounds we can create. And that's really what we're getting to in week four. It's going to pull from all these things from part of week two. Quantum numbers is going to come back a little bit. And uh, week three with the periodic trends and uh, moving on to covalent bonding. Uh, for a lot of people, this is uh, where chemistry starts to get a lot more interesting because you can start to make compounds. You can start to look at biological compounds. You can start to look at natural compounds. Um, most materials are going to be covalent materials. Uh, so there's a lot that's going to happen there. Uh, and there's going to be several videos on how to look at these different things. For my personal reflections, my personal reflections. Um, th this week, I, I know, was really stressful for a lot of you. There were midterms. There were other things going on. Um, 
we had a little bit of a lighter week last week in this class. We only had two assignments rather than our typical five. Uh, and part of that was because there just wasn't a particularly fantastic lab to do with the material last week. And also because we knew midterms were coming up and, and the first two weeks had a lot going on and we wanted to make a week that was a little bit lighter for all of you. Um, we used some of that time to try and get ahead for week four and week five in terms of our preparation. Uh, but I've just been having trouble remembering things. Uh, I left, I, I just keep leaving things places and not being able to find them. I keep thinking I've responded to messages that I haven't responded to. Um, I think just the similarity of every day has started to make it so I think I've done something, but I actually haven't done that thing yet. Uh, because I did it yesterday for something else and not today for that thing. So that, that's been something that's been, uh, I've become aware of and I'm trying to make sure I'm more careful about it. Um, the other thing that's been really surprising to me this week, I guess not that surprising, um, I think we all knew that missing class was going to be a thing we'd feel eventually, but um, I really miss class. I miss, I miss, uh, as much as it was always a challenge and kind of like, not tedious, but it was, it was always like, okay, I have to go to class, it's got a specific time, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's part of what I really enjoyed about this, this job that is teaching. Um, and talking to several of you in office hours, um, people are missing class as well. It, it's hard. There's, uh, especially these early classes in college, you meet people that you're going to know for the rest of your college career, potentially the rest of your life. I still have friends from my undergrad days and it's, you know, people I met in my early chemistry classes, in my early physics classes, in my early English classes. Uh, and so not having that space where we come together and find that camaraderie in trying to figure out chemistry or whatever class you're looking at uh, is something that you're all starting to miss. and. Uh, I hope it makes it so in the future when we have class, people are like, yeah, I'm gonna go to class every time because I've seen the alternative and it's not, it's not the best. Um, but, you know, this, this is still a temporary situation. We'll get through it. Um, we'll just keep working on it. So, uh, the next thing to talk about are some of the muddiest points. So there's a few muddiest points that people brought up um, that we're going to talk about. Naming compounds. Uh, let me see, I got a little list of note here so I don't forget things. Naming compounds, empirical formula, and equations. and quantum numbers. So we're gonna talk about all of those things. Uh, Nate, we'll start with uh, naming compounds. Uh, for quantum numbers, I, I don't know what I can say besides what I've already said in the video that I made, but I'll, I'll try to think of something. Um, let's start with naming compounds, and to do that, we're gonna look at a couple resources. Okay, I wanna show you two resources we have to help with naming compounds. The first can be found at adam.calpoly.edu. This is actually a great list of resources. It's not as relevant this quarter since a lot of it is about on-campus resources, but you'll notice we've got this link to LabPal, uh, this web MO software, which we might use in week five. Uh, the crystal structure simulator is also linked through this. Uh, and one of the important things here that I find really useful is uh, this thing down here, which you can almost miss, the polyatomic ion flashcards. So this is going to give us our list of polyatomic ions. Uh, works great on mobile devices, so you can see SO3, and you can, you can get that sulfite, you can show it, and it'll tell you, and then you can hit random, and you can get a new one. And so this gives you a way to kind of just randomly practice naming compounds and just getting the names kind of 
in your head. You can do it so it's the name of the compound you give the ion, or you can do it so it's the ion and you have to get the name. And these go into how we name compounds. Uh, these are going to become more important as we move on in the quarter uh, because we're going to start looking at polyatomic ions next week. Uh, the other resource is going to be if you come to our course page and you go to the modules, right here in the useful handouts is the common ions list. And if you open this up, uh, we've got a whole lot of useful things here. So we've got our common cations. These are the common charges we learned about by looking at periodic trends. You'll notice our alkaline metals are the plus ones, our alkaline earth metals are the plus twos, our halogens are the minus ones, and our oxygen group is the minus twos. Uh, there are some predictable ones after that, but it gets a little more complicated. Uh, we will be talking about uh, the metals with their Roman numerals. You can see the common charges for these variable cations. I don't know the plus two, plus three. I don't typically use the Latin names in general chemistry. I go with the English name and the Roman numeral. And you'll notice this iron three is, or sorry, iron two, iron three, this is named regardless of what's attached to it. Iron two is iron with a plus two charge. Iron three is iron with a plus three charge. Lead four, that's Roman numeral four, is lead with a plus four charge. Uh, the Latin names is part of what was confusing people last time, uh, in the last week. Uh, when you use the eight, when you use the ite, when you use the eid, uh, and that's really kind of related to these Latin names where you've got your ferrous and your ferric, which we're not, like I said, I'm not going to worry about that in a gen chem class. Typically, I'm going to use the English names. But these suffixes, just like these suffixes, uh, are kind of problematic because they're historic. They were determined before we fully understood what we were looking at. The difference between ferric and ferrous is really the number of oxygens that attach to it. And when we look at plumic versus plumus for lead, uh, you notice the ick and the ick, they don't have the same charge, but they're both the higher charge. They're both the thing that's going to attract more oxygens. Uh, and this is something that we're going to really come, uh, have to discuss again in week six when we're looking at reduction oxidation reactions, where we actually look at the electrons moving and how charge, charge changes in our compounds. But the names, and part of the confusion in the naming is the, how the suffixes relate to what we're actually talking about. So the way I think about it is to remember that eight is going to be the thing with uh, more charge and it is going to be the thing, or sorry, uh, more oxygens and it is going to be the thing with less oxygens. Just uh, ferric and ferrous, kind of the same idea, except for those suffixes are for positive ions, and the eight and it endings are for negative ions. So when you look at something like nitrate and nitrite, uh, you can kind of break down the name. A lot of people just go for straight memorizing. They're like, here are 25 things that I have to memorize or for looking at the entire page, there's like 30 things I just have to memorize. The common cations and anions, uh, we can just get those from the periodic trends. We remember one rule and that kind of gives us all of those. Uh, the same thing can be done for our common polyatomic ions and the eight and eight endings. Uh, and the ides, right? The ides are when we have these single negative charges. The eight ending tells us the eight or the ite means that there's oxygen attached. And then we can use the beginning to figure out what the other atom in it is. So nitrate is gonna be something with nitrogen. Nitrite's gonna be something with nitrogen. Sulfate's gonna be something with sulfur. Uh, chromate is going to be something with chromium. Uh, there are a few weird ones, phosphate, Nice predictable one. Carbonate has carbon in it. Oxalate gets a kind of funny name though. So there are of course exceptions, but for the most part, 
uh, we can learn a lot of these by looking for patterns the same way we did with the periodic table. Eight is going to be this thing with more oxygens. Eight is going to be the thing with less oxygens. Uh, another great way to look for patterns in this is to notice uh, which of the eights have three oxygens. So chlorate is three oxygens, nitrate is three oxygens, carbonate is three oxygens. And then the other ones are going to be a different number of oxygens, right? Looking for those patterns. The ide endings are going to be those things that are just single charge, no oxygens attached. Again, part of the problem with this is the fact that the names for these compounds were determined or given before we necessarily understood what the compounds were made out of. It was all understood through oxygens attached. How many oxygens were attached? Were there oxygens attached? Were there more oxygens attached or less oxygens attached? It wasn't specifically the number, it was this relative kind of thinking. Uh, and we'll see this even more dramatically when we move on to looking at reduction oxidation reactions. With empirical formulas, equations, and quantum numbers, I'm going to kind of emphasize the same thing with all of these. And that is to say, um, most of these are going to be definitional concepts. That is to say, if we are using the textbook well, uh, these become pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just not necessarily easy to use the textbook well. So I'll, I'll give a couple suggestions for how I think it's best to use a textbook, and then we'll get into, into some specifics about each of these. The thing I'd like to start with is uh, reading the summary. It's always strange to me that you can have a chapter that's you know 10 to 40 to 50 pages, and yet they can distill almost everything in the chapter down to a few paragraphs. Uh, clearly, the, the summary is not going to have the same context, which can be useful. It's not going to have the same amount of detail, but it's going to give you all of those things that are most important. So I like to read the summary book or I read the chapter, so that way I'm kind of priming my brain for what's most important. Uh, two is... Reading the definitions. This is kind of going along the same idea of the summary. They, the things they define are going to be either new concepts or they're going to be the most important concepts. And whether it's something new or something really important, we want to be thinking about that before we're reading the bulk of the chapter. So that way, when we run into something, we can have an idea of like, oh, this is something I should already know because it wasn't in the definitions for this chapter. Or this is something that's going to be important because it was in the definitions for the chapter. After I've got my mind kind of primed for what's going to be important in the chapter, then I'll go ahead and skim read the chapter, making sure that uh, I pay more attention to the parts that have those important concepts, and maybe less attention to those parts that don't. Uh, one of the problems with textbooks is they have this information that's considered contextual, right? It's a cute story to help you remember it. It's, a, it's an interesting tidbit to make it more relevant to your life or to something you might be interested in, but it's not necessarily related to the core ideas of what we're trying to learn. It's trying to provide context to help memory, but it's, for me, it's handy to know when something's absolutely important and when something's kind of anecdotally important. After that, I will test my understanding. There are answers to the practice problems in the textbook at the end of uh, the book. Uh, if you're using the digital version, you can just click. There are blue numbers. You can click on the blue numbers. It takes you to the answer. For some of the problems, there's even a video solution uh, made by LAs in the past that you can look at. But I would say do at least four or five problems where you might get stuck or you might do fine before you look at answers. Uh, we want to look for patterns in our understanding. We want to find out, 
Is it always the same definition or the same idea that we're having trouble with when we're looking at doing problems and actually checking for our understanding? So now let's specifically look at empirical formulas, equations, and quantum numbers. Empirical formulas require spelling. I mean an M in there. Empirical formulas are actually the formulas, if we're looking at the historical definition of this, the, the formulas that are determined from some experimental method. And typically they are a mass ratio uh, rather than an actual number of atoms. This will come up very heavily as we go into week four and we start looking at uh, covalent compounds that are going to be made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. I could have something like this, uh, CH. Four O. Oh, that actually wouldn't make any sense. Let's do CH3O. That makes a little more sense. Uh, or we could do CH2O, right? Just some made-up formula. Uh, this would have the smallest possible ratio. Something that would have this as its empirical formula would be C2H4O2 or C3H6O3 or C10H20O10. Notice in each of these, if I take the smallest ratio of the things, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, all of them will have the same empirical formula. And this same idea is what applies to the crystal structures we were looking at last time, the smallest ratio of elements inside the compound which is different than the molecular formula of how many elements are inside the compound. If we're looking at uh, some crystal structure, I can't draw these very well, but bear with me. Well, we've got some face-centered cubic. Right? That looks like a face-centered cubic. We've got some things I'm not showing. And then we've got some edge pieces, right? This would be sodium chloride. You'd have to imagine, and you can see why we use computer simulations instead of my drawings, because I'm not even showing the depth and in the insides, because if I showed the other three planes, ooh, it gets ugly. But if we look at this, this would have a structure. This is sodium chloride. It would have four sodiums in it, and it would have four chlorines. That's kind of the ionic formula, right? Total number of sodiums, total number of chlorines in what I'm picturing. The empirical formula for that would be the smallest ratio of that, NaCl, one-to-one -one ratio. So in terms of determining empirical formula, it really comes back to that ability uh, to visualize in three dimensions, to make sense of the two-dimensional structure, to understand that these ones on the edges are going to get cut, uh, and knowing how to count the ions in the crystal structure. Uh, there were several videos on that, so I go back and watch those for more details if you're looking for more details. Uh, that's empirical formula. It's mostly definitional, which is why I mentioned the textbook part. Another part that's mostly definitional is looking at equations. Um, so far in this class, we've had quite a few equations. Uh, I strongly encourage always using the equations sheet and having it handy whenever working. Uh, and there's a few important things. Uh, the first important thing I'll say is it really is each equation is like a definition. Um, the main thing so you can learn words that go along with each definition. You can learn the terms. Uh, the main thing I look for is the key terms for each thing. Right? The, the key term energy is not really going to clue us into a particular equation to use because most of the equations use the term energy. Uh, it could be kinetic energy, photon energy, potential energy, lots of different possibilities. If it was specifically photon energy, 
that would specify just a few possible equations. We've got an equation that is the energy of the photon. We've got an equation that uses, actually that would be the most likely. We've got another one that's absolute value of energy of photon, or sorry, energy of photon, just in terms of a energy. We've got energy of photon related to the change in energy in the atom. Right? We could be talking about that. Could be talking about the energy of the photon relating to the work function. So energy of photon would give us a couple different possibilities. And then at that point, it's, well, OK, what extra information is given in the problem? Does it mention an atom? Does it mention a metal surface or the term work function? Or does it just say, what's the energy wavelength? Uh, both of these, all three of these also have wavelength because photon energy often has wavelength. So if we had photon energy and wavelength, that again wouldn't give us much more specificity. But we want to start thinking about equations in terms of physical relations. Uh, one of the things that I find most fascinating about chemistry, especially with the mathematics, is it's actually representing things in the physical world, in the real world. So it's not just mathematics, it's not just equations, but there's some physics behind each one. And that gets back to using the textbook. Uh, perhaps the most confusing out of these are, are the two Rydberg equations, where we've got 1 over lambda equals Rydberg constant times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared versus change in energy of the atom is equal to negative Rydberg constant times 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. These two equations are really relating to the same thing. Um, you'll notice that there's a difference in wavelength versus energy. Uh, and that's really the clue for which constants we use. Uh, one of the important things is this one that's 1 over wavelength. is only for emission, and it solves for the wavelength of the photon. The second equation is the energy of the atom. Could be positive or negative. This one, we need n1 to be less than n2 to guarantee that we have emission and to guarantee that we get a positive wavelength. Uh, the key for doing this, though, is recognizing that this is going to be inverse meters. This is going to be joules. So when we're looking for which Rydberg constant we use, um, because not everyone's consistent with their subscripts to denote the different Rydberg constants, though we should try to be, uh, there's a Rydberg constant that is 1.097 times 10 to the positive 7 inverse meters, inverse meters. And this one, 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, joules, joules. Our n values, our quantum numbers in there, are unitless. So by following the units, we can pay a little bit more. Uh, by following the units, we can uh, figure out which version of the constants we use. Again, this idea that we're not just doing math, we're relating to the physical world. In terms of the quantum numbers, this last thing that people were having trouble with, right? quantum numbers, uh, the quantum numbers, again, are a very definitional thing for us in this class. Uh, the reason that I'm, I have a bit of pause about this is I really want to launch, and there's a whole separate textbook sitting on my, on my desk that's uh, 200, 300 pages to get to the idea of quantum numbers, talking about where these ideas come from, the mathematics attached to them, the energy, uh, the energy considerations for all of it. Uh, in this class, what we're really doing is we're looking at quantum numbers mapped to a function. That function gives us electron distribution. That electron distribution gives us periodic trends.
right? And so the idea is we can kind of skip uh, two of these steps, and we can relate the quantum numbers directly to the periodic trends. Uh, this is where we talk about the n values, the l values, and the m sub l values. Uh, this gets us to shells, this gets us to where things are in the periodic table, this gets us to um, radius, all of those things. Uh, the L values being like S, P, D for L equals 0, 1, or 2. Uh, and so this is part of what confuses people about quantum numbers. We, we give you this set of numbers and we're like, here you go, it means this. There's really several steps in between the quantum numbers and the periodic trends. And we're more, in, in my opinion, we're skipping that in this class because it's solving differential equations that are relatively complicated. Uh, getting these weird mathematical functions, Legendre, uh, Legendre polynomials, Laguerre polynomials, uh, and putting those together to get these functions that tell us where the electron's likely to be, all based off of the energetic interactions of the electron with the nucleus. So we can even, before quantum numbers, we can go, uh, We can go Schrodinger equation, which we, I don't think we even mentioned this quarter. Uh, but there's essentially an equation which accounts for energy. Which accounts for energy interactions. Uh, and most of this we tried to skip over. And we really tried to just emphasize this connection of the quantum numbers to the periodic trends. Uh, this idea of mostly getting to that idea of shell and radius, uh, which is going to allow us to talk about ionization energy, electron affinity, uh, radius. So it makes quantum numbers somewhat obtuse, right? Hard to see, not sure what's going on. Uh, but we're really doing it in just a definitional way. Uh, Dr. Scott's video on quantum numbers talks more about the functions and electron distributions. Uh, my video on quantum numbers uh, doesn't really talk about the functions too much, but does a little bit on the electron distributions, but doesn't get to the periodic trends yet. Uh, so you kind of need some material from week two with week three to get quantum numbers and uh, periodic trends together to see that. Uh, the video I did on quantum numbers and radius does this type of connection. I would encourage uh, watching that. But if there was confusion, it's probably because of, you, you probably felt like there was something missing in there. And there, there was. Uh, it's really difficult, uh, for me at least. Uh, I know there are other instructors who are like, we shouldn't even do this. Uh, but I, this is, this is my, th th this is my favorite thing, the Schrodinger equation. Um, we're not even doing it. So, uh, and it's the impetus for all of this, right? It's really just thinking about the energetic interactions. Um, since I, I, I would go into more detail about this, and if anyone comments on the video and says, hey, do another video on one of these things, I'll do it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, one of the things that's been really tough, going back to like uh, personal reflections, is we've been making these videos, and it's like Dr. Ness' video had like 50 views, 60 views for the entire week um, for her welcome video. My welcome video from two weeks ago still is at like 100 views, 120 views. Uh, you know. As instructors, making these videos is something new for us. It's something challenging. Um, and it's not being utilized. And at some point, it just becomes discouraging. Uh, but as long as, as long as people are asking for them, I'll keep making them. Um, uh, so yeah, keep asking. I'll keep making them. I'll, I'll hopefully get better and better at making them over time as well. Uh, week four scary to think about, but we're technically halfway through. There's only nine weeks in this quarter, so whew, we're getting there. Let's do it.